night. Surveillance powers and the Russia investigation, cutting off Qatar, and the woman on trial for a young man's suicide. When I sat down and read all the suicide notes, I cried. British police identified the third man responsible for Saturday's attack in London as Yusuf Zagba. Police say the 22-year-old wasn't on their radar before Saturday, but there are reports that Italian authorities alerted British and Moroccan officials about his travels to Syria through Turkey. Another attacker, Rashid Rodwan, wasn't on a watch list either. But Khurram Shahzad Butt, a British-born London resident, was. Last year, he appeared in the documentary The Jihadis Next Door on the UK's Channel 4. Paris authorities have opened a counterterrorism investigation after a man shouted, this is for Syria, before attacking a police officer with a hammer outside Notre Dame Cathedral. Another officer shot and wounded the man, who also had knives on him. The assailant, who police haven't identified yet, was carrying an Algerian student ID card. During the attack, several hundred people were trapped inside the church, and witnesses outside began running when they heard the gunshots. After months of preparation, American-backed Kurdish and Arab fighters began a direct assault to retake control of Raqqa, the Islamic State's de facto capital since 2014. Uber has fired more than 20 people today. The dismissals are a result of the first of two internal investigations the company launched after a former employee wrote a blog post alleging sexual harassment and discrimination. Uber hasn't yet released the recommendations from the other, larger investigation being led by former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder. In Washington, the countdown is already beginning to the biggest public event so far in the Russia investigation. The public testimony of fired FBI Director James Comey in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee on Thursday. But Thursday's showdown comes with a warm-up act, a hearing tomorrow featuring four of the most powerful players in the intelligence community, the acting FBI Director Andrew McCabe, NSA Chief Mike Rogers, Director of National Intelligence Dan Coats, and Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. The hearing will focus not on what investigators know about Trump campaign collusion with Russia, but on how the government conducts domestic surveillance in the first place. Alexandra Jaffe explains. There's no way around it. At least part of tomorrow's hearing will be Democrats trying to drag answers out of the witnesses on the Russia investigation. Multiple Senate Democratic aides told me that they want Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein to admit what they say he told a closed-door briefing of senators last month, that he knew about James Comey's firing before he wrote the memo that Trump used to justify it. They also want to press Coates and Rogers on reports that Trump asked them to downplay the Russia investigation, which they say is evidence of obstruction of justice. But the actual focus of the hearing, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, is arguably just as big an issue for national security as whether the president tried to obstruct justice. FISA is the law governing foreign intelligence collection, and parts of it are set to expire at the end of the year without congressional approval. That includes a key controversial part, Section 702, which gives the government broad authority for the targeting of persons reasonably believed to be located outside the United States to acquire foreign intelligence information without a warrant. That means American citizens could get swept up in that surveillance. That's that incidental collection you hear Republicans complain about a lot in the Russia investigation. It's how, for example, House Intelligence Chairman Devin Nunes tried to deflect controversy over General Flynn's contacts with the Russian ambassador. What I've read uh, seems to me to be some level of surveillance activity, perhaps legal, uh, but I don't know that it's right and I don't know that the American people would be comfortable uh, with, with what I've read. And it's going to be the focus of a lot of debate at tomorrow's hearing. It also poses a new challenge for Republicans on the committee. On the one hand, most of the committee's hawks are pretty big supporters of government surveillance. 
On the other hand, their playbook for avoiding the real troubling developments out of the Russia investigation has been railing against government leaks and what they see as the mishandling of classified information by the intelligence community. It's gonna be tough for them to defend government surveillance and Section 702 while trying to pivot away from Russia by attacking the intelligence community. Today, Brazil's electoral court restarted a trial that could bring down the country's president, Michel Temer, in an oozing corruption scandal that's contaminated every level of Brazil's political establishment. Temer, along with the former president, Dilma Rousseff, is accused of funding his campaign with money connected to a $2 billion bribery scheme revealed in the country's notorious car wash investigation. Temer faces a separate charge for allegedly trying to buy the silence of Eduardo Cunha, an imprisoned politician and a key witness in that investigation. And just three days ago, a congressman and aide to the president was arrested carrying a bag containing $154,000 in alleged hush money. Temer only became president because Rousseff was impeached for breaking finance laws last year. Half of the members of the commission that impeached her faced charges of corruption or other serious crimes themselves. If Temer is impeached or indicted, Rodrigo Maia, the head of the lower house, will take over for 30 days. But he too is being investigated in the car wash scheme. Brazil's Congress will then have to elect someone to serve until the country holds presidential elections in October of 2018. But it won't be easy to fill the job. At the moment, half of all politicians in Brazil are under investigation for corruption. The State Department's new spokesperson, Heather Nauert, held her first press briefing today. And the former Fox and Friends host came prepared, sort of. And if you all will uh, give me the grace as I go through my book here, because this is a uh, pretty meaty book. Wait a second. One subject she was prepped on was Qatar, the new nation non grata of the Middle East. The secretary talked about this today. He said every country in the region has their own obligations and they need to live up to terminate their support for terrorism and extremism, however it manifests itself anywhere in the world. But she did little to explain how the country went from partner to pariah seemingly overnight with full support from the White House. Qatar falling out with its neighbors might not sound like a big deal, but it could have huge consequences for stability in the Gulf and for international markets around the world. As of yesterday, a number of Arab nations, including Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates, have cut diplomatic ties with Qatar and severed all air, sea, and land links with the country. It's escalated fast, and the measures are unprecedented. The tiny Gulf state imports 99% of its food, so it's essentially now under siege with supermarket shelves emptied as residents stock up on supplies. Why is this happening? The countries involved are all aligned with Saudi Arabia in a foreign policy approach that seeks to counter the influence of Iran and curb support for groups like the Muslim Brotherhood. Why is it happening now? Well, it comes just a few weeks after President Trump held a summit in the Saudi capital Riyadh where he stated unwavering support for Saudi Arabia and its allies. That seems to have been the green light for a push to make Qatar, which had been going its own way on some of these issues, fall in line with the Saudi-dominated regional club known as the GCC. Regional analysts I've spoken to say what Saudi Arabia really wants is regime change in Qatar. But where Washington stands on all of this is unclear. President Trump seemed to endorse the move with some tweets, but Qatar is also a close US ally. In fact, it's home to the Middle East headquarters of the US Air Force. There are more than 10,000 US personnel based there, and it's a crucial hub for US military operations in the region. In a conversation by phone with Vice News Tonight, a spokesman for the US Central Command said the standoff was already impacting US servicemen taking commercial flights in and out of the country. He said the US military was grateful for its relationship with Qatar, and that he expected that to continue for some time. Today in Massachusetts, a trial began over the death of an 18-year-old man who committed suicide in 2014 after being encouraged to end his life by his then-girlfriend, Michelle Carter. Carter now faces prison time for involuntary manslaughter in a type of case that rarely goes to trial. But in Missouri, prosecutors recently charged another woman, 
in an even more unusual suicide case. Michael Moynihan reports. On December 21st, 17-year-old Kenneth Sutner placed a series of notes in his bedroom and disappeared into the woods behind his parents' house. Sutner died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. In Glasgow, Missouri, a town of barely a thousand people, it didn't take long for the rumor mill to start churning. Whispers that at school and work, Sutner had been intensely bullied. The police began investigating. A month after Sutner's death, a young woman was led away in handcuffs and confronted with an unprecedented charge criminal responsibility for another person's suicide. We had an early dismissal that day. We had emergency faculty meetings. We took our kids grade level by grade level, walked them through as much information as we could about the tragedy. Mike Reynolds is the Glasgow High School superintendent. Hi guys, how are you? And also the bus driver for this small K through 12 school. With only 300 students, Reynolds has a personal relationship with almost all of the kids, including Kenny Sutner. Kenny was a polite, sweet young man, had a good sense of humor, outgoing. Uh, the older he got, the more he got involved in things. Frank Flaspoler was one of the first people called to the scene the night Kenny committed suicide. He's been the Howard County coroner for 28 years. Looked pretty obvious as a suicide. I had a meeting with the sheriff's department, and at that meeting we kind of talked about what some of the neighbors had said, what suicide notes looked like, and that's when we kind of got the feeling that it was, could, could have been caused by bullying. But when I sat down and read all the suicide notes, I cried. In one note, Sutner wrote, it's just I can't do this anymore. I don't fit in. It will be a better place once I'm gone. In another, I'm not crazy. It's just I shouldn't be here. No one likes me. I have no future. I'm a fat ass, and no one likes a fat ass. I really love you guys. It's my choice. Respect it. This is bullying that is so bad that a kid, 17-year-old boy, took his life. We need to do something to prevent that from happening again. Flaspolar invoked a power granted to him by the state of Missouri. Hi, Frank Flaspolar, coroner of Howard County. All this jury is over. He convened something called a coroner's inquest. According to Missouri law, a coroner's inquest can be used to determine, quote, how and by whom the deceased died. But the cause of Kenny's death isn't in dispute. So Flaspolar interpreted the law in a unique way. He'd try to determine the psychological cause of Kenny's death. The inquest, which isn't a trial, but a public hearing that can recommend criminal charges, had a six-person jury and a special prosecutor. Kenny's suicide and the subsequent investigation had transfixed and divided the community. And this is entirely up to you, right? This is entirely your decision. Yes, that is correct. The inquest quickly zeroed in on Harley Branham, Kenny's manager at the local Dairy Queen. Witnesses accused Harley of frequently berating Kenny, once throwing a hamburger at him and making him get on his stomach and clean under chairs in an ice cream machine. A friend claimed that Kenny once said Harley, quote, made him want to kill himself. But another testified that she, quote, didn't think anything of such comments, dismissing them as the type of hyperbole one often heard at work. And was Kenny calling out people in the notes that, that had been his tormentors, uh, individuals? No, no, and no. Oh. So he didn't mention the work incidents actually in the notes? No. Harley, for her part, testified that she hadn't ever mistreated Kenny at work and said that if she'd insulted him, it was just as a joke. But the testimony of the other witnesses was enough to convince the jury that Harley Branham was the principal cause of Kenny's death. The special prosecutor charged Harley with a felony, involuntary manslaughter, something that could result in four years in prison. The coroner's inquest didn't allow Harley legal representation. Jeff Hilbrenner is now Harley's lawyer. In this situation, there was simply just one version of facts told one story. And so no witness was subject to cross-examination. No witness was subject to further inquiry. How do you know these things? When did these things occur? Who else was present? Who else could have witnessed these things? And so, I, you know, I think it's the, the six jurors there saw a set of facts and saw no criticism of those facts. But it isn't just the process of charging Harley that bothers Hillbrenner. 
It's the very premise that one person can be criminally liable for a suicide. While people have been prosecuted for directly inciting others to kill themselves, Vice News has been unable to find a single other case where a defendant was held criminally liable for what amounts to being mean. Our system requires that a jury not convict someone because they might have bullied someone before, no matter what the charge is, or convict someone because they've done, they were a mean person. It's not illegal to be mean to someone, is basically what you're saying. Well, essentially, no, it's not illegal to be a jerk. And we're disputing these facts, but let's assume Harley was mean to this young guy at work. Does that, how does that get us to being responsible for him, you know, ultimately taking his own life? The inquest also went after the Glasgow public school system. And Reynolds says that since the inquest, the school has received a steady stream of hate mail. The aftermath and the reality is here, it has uh, done a lot of damage to our school community and our town. Critics of the inquest told us that a singular focus on bullying ignored a far more complex psychological portrait of Kenny. In the notes Kenny wrote the night he killed himself, for instance, he made an unexplained reference to something that had happened last night. He also wrote, quote, please forgive me for my sin I've done. Flaspolar maintains that the inquest was a fact-finding mission and a search for justice. Jeff Hilbrenner thinks the inquest unfairly targeted his client and that its outcome was preordained. If Harley is vindicated in court, is there a long-term damage either way? Well, I, I mean, you use the word vindication, and what does that really mean? But the reality is, she's still gonna deal with any time an employer, a friend, anyone ever puts her name into a search engine, there's gonna be dozens and dozens of things describing Harley in a way that I don't think is fair. Harley's life has changed forever. What do you think about that? Okay. Uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, if, if I had to do it all over again, would I do it? Yes. Now, Harley's life has changed. Did I make a change? Or did she make a change when she was doing the bullying? So who's, who do we blame for her life changed? Bullies typically don't end up in shackles, though, do they? Well, I suppose not, so. Movie star drug. Illegal. Politicians, they don't want to make California pancakes. Illegal. They don't want to make ski equipment. Illegal. They don't want to make designer jeans. Illegal. They don't want to make white powder. Illegal. The UK goes to the polls in two days to choose the winner of a general election that has been both joyless and exhausting. And the British government has given artist Cornelia Parker the unenviable job of discovering some artistic inspiration in those campaigns. The role was created by Parliament in 2001, and it's funded by the taxpayer. I spend more time out of the studio investigating the world than I do in, so I'm always out and about taking photographs. Uh, and so the, my work is almost uh, commentary on what's happening, but in, not in the literal way, though. <laughs> In past elections, the official artworks have been predictably dull. That doesn't figure to be the case with Parker, though, who's made her mark on the art world with offbeat experimental works, like erecting a house on the roof of the Met in New York, or displaying the actress Tilda Swinton asleep in a glass case. Her latest exhibition is at the Frith Street Gallery in London and also takes inspiration from an election campaign. But this piece was made in New York um, at Halloween. And I made it with a backdrop of the American election going on. Okay. Both the candidates um, were, were from New York, and, and that was all people talked about. Because I was making this kind of work, and I was all I could do is watch the news and read the papers and feel very kind of paralysed almost. And so when they asked me if I wanted to be the election artist, I said, yeah, why not? Cornelia Parker's work has often been political. In 2015, she created the Wikipedia page for the Magna Carta as a 43-foot long embroidery. This tribute to a document about freedom was hand-stitched by 203 people 
36 of them serving prisoners. However, being selected as the election artist also means sacrificing some creative control. The terms of the role state that Cornelia's work can't favour one political party over another. Yeah, that must be really frustrating for you as somebody who um, is passionate about yes. politics. Do you not want to just jump in sometimes well, and go, what are you saying? I know, uh, the least, all they can do is sack me, really. <laughs> <laughs> One of Cornelia's most famous works is Cold Dark Matter, an exploded view. Quite literally, as the project involves requesting the army to blow up a shed. Cornelia is recording the events of the UK's general election via Instagram a real-time stream of imagery that will help inform her finished work. I'm doing an, uh, an Instagram feed. Yeah. So if I, perhaps I can get your name, can I? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I quite like um, the idea of having to be completely impartial. And so I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm finding, you know, that I've got a photograph of a tree leaning to the left, then I have to have a photograph of a tree leaning to the right. <laughs> One spirited moment captured by Cornelia came days after the Manchester terror attack as a crowd of supporters of the UK Independence Party turned on a reporter. It sounds like you're near as damn it blaming the Prime Minister for this attack. Oh, there's lots of uh, little themes that are emerging that I'm, uh, and they're things that I didn't know were there beforehand. I, I, I've described it to somebody else as like, bit, uh, like having Jerusalem syndrome. Even the slightest yeah. shadow looks yeah. like Jesus, or you know, a, a spilled cup of coffee you know, looks like the Virgin Mary, or whatever. So you're just looking around constantly, yeah. trying everything. To solve everything. I'm finding it's very obsessive compulsive. I'm, I must really have to lie in a dark room after this. Taking what she's observed, Cornelia Parker will produce a piece of art by the end of the year. Can we squeeze out of you? Will it be material-based or will it be video-based? It might be photographic or video-based at the moment. I mean, because that's what I've, yeah. that's the media I've been working in. And that's, it sort of lends itself to that. I can think of loads of ideas, but I don't know what I'm going to feel like once the election's over. Fire. Oh shit. That was sick. Yeah. Oh shit. That was sick. I don't do this. Dumb it down, go stupid. Since 17, been counting M's, my bank accounts on goofy. This song is dark, bro. Oh my god, it's so dark. We got the All-Stars, we got Young Jeezy, Big Boy, and a fucking dope-ass sample on a dope beat. Atlanta's in the house on this one. He was leather and he was screaming, swinging chains against... This should be in like a, a French film. Dark film about kids that are doing drugs, got stuck in some bad situation, and they're, they're trying to get out. What is it? LCD sound system. That's LCD sound system? Holy shit. Oh my God. I love James Murphy. Oh, I'm trying, 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 Her voice is like, as she talks, it's just so, it sucks you in. I just love her voice. No idea. Selena Gomez. Selena Gomez, holy shit. This is dope because you can see her versatility. You know, she, she can do like these big soaring vocal songs and then she does like these indie vibe songs where she can play that role too. I like that, I li I, I'm, I'm digging this song. Candy left over from Halloween The unified theory of everything Love left over from lovers leaving but he's got this young voice, but he sounds like someone that would listen to Willie Nelson at the same time, but listen to um, Bright Eyes. But he's got like that old soul in his voice too. That's Vice News Tonight for Tuesday, June 6th.